since we have so many CNC's upstairs now, we don't have any room for any of our fab equipment. So this area right here, that used to be just full of storage and random stuff, but it's gonna be housing our Avid CNC and our brand new laser cutter. So this is gonna be very crucial for our projects when we get back to that. And what I'm doing right now specifically is I'm fixing some of the insulation up there. So this bad boy got the Yale. She fires right up, watch this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This thing was a snowbank a week ago. Mm -hmm. Hey Mike, how are you? What's up, Daryl? We gotta uh, move a big piece of equipment today. So, uh, oh, it's, it's moved today. that's the plan, that's the plan. Uh, we, need, we need the room. Uh, well, our hill's pretty icy, so the plan is to not try to carry this down with a forklift. It's kind of a little bit too big to really balance on our forks well. So the plan is uh, uh, we're gonna chain it to the bucket of the excavator, pick it up, and then just drive the excavator down the hill. Are you driving this thing? No, I don't know how what I'm doing. I'll get out. You wanna sit in my lap like, a, like my four-year-old? Um, what do you think of that? <laughs> gonna hop over that transition, okay? She's gonna be close. This is how they built the pyramids, right, Ian? Yeah. <laughs> hey, B. Hold on there, uh, Tyler, just a sec. Yeah. All done, just like that. With the new transformer installed, we did a test where we turned on every single CNC machine in the shop. That's 32 CNC machines running. It was drawing over 125 kilowatts, um, but it all worked. Now there's a new problem we have to solve. It turns out that the Haas machines use a lot of compressed air just to run the spindles. And by a lot, I mean, I was running both of these compressors full tilt. That's 30 horsepower just to run the spindles. That means I, I don't really have any wiggle room for other machines, or if either of these machines goes down, my production goes down. That's an issue, I need redundancy. So I bought another compressor, and this one is a 30 horsepower, and it has the added benefit of I can run the laser cutter off of this, because these compressors run at a higher pressure. I think they run up to 250 PSI, which is enough to do laser cutting with instead of running nitrogen, so that's gonna save me a bunch of money. Hey, Tyler. Let's talk about the laser. All right, the laser. Um, <laughs> Funny enough, we, uh, so we got this laser cutter from Best Cutter. We didn't pay for it. They provided it to us for exposure in our videos. Um, we made this deal back before we sold the last laser cutter, but we didn't have a space to put it. So they've been holding, we had, <laughs> we, we could have gotten this machine a lot earlier, but we didn't have anywhere to put it. We finally have a space for it. I'm so glad that it's finally showed up. We're very excited to start using it. Um, it is going to be much nicer than our last laser, cut laser cutter as well, for a couple of reasons. First off, it's going to be twice the power. There is currently a three kilowatt laser source in it right now, but we're gonna get that upgraded to six kilowatts, so we'll get nicer cuts and we'll be able to do thicker material. Um, Seconds, we'll be able to run it off of the compressor. Um, again, th these compressors I did buy from Best Cutter, um, but this one was free. Uh, so yeah, I'll be able to run it off of the compressor instead of with nitrogen and then it's just a bit more user friendly. So instead of taking your material and this like super heavy steel plates and lifting it into the machine, you just pull out a drawer and then you put your material on with your forklift or whatever and then you slide the drawer in. So that's gonna be a lot nicer. And then the ventilation is a lot nicer because it's all just kind of contained a lot better. Um, and then it's smaller so it can fit in, in better spaces. We never, really used the full size of the last laser cutter. Um, like I think it was four, up to four by eight sheets and we never put the full, or never used the full size. Um, so this one's a bit better suited for us. 
Any questions? Any questions, Tyler? Tyler's the one that actually has to use it all the time. So I think he's excited. I'm and very excited. All right, so a lot's been going on since the last vlog update. So let me catch you guys up to speed. Currently, I'm working on our engineering resource planning flow. Um, my software has been working great and it's given us some awesome data to be able to actually track down all the little issues we're having. But today I want to talk about an issue that we had at the start of the production and I actually solved almost two months ago now. But we got busy filming other stuff and never ended up sharing what that solution was. So to catch you up on that, the spring that holds the bits in is currently being spot welded to the back of this titanium, which we've found is a good, super strong solution um, to make two parts into one. Now, the issue is when you spot weld, you are basically melting the material and kind of squishing it together. So if you look real close, you can kind of see what the spot welds look like. Now, since this is on the inside of the knife, aesthetically, it doesn't matter that much because you're never going to see them. But the problem is, if you look at the spot welds from the side, sometimes the molten titanium sticks up a little bit. And if it sticks up too much, because of the tight tolerances on the Smith blade, the knife, or the actual blade, when it closes, can drag on those surfaces, A, scratching the blade, and B, making a unsatisfactory blade open. So, we need some way of getting rid of the spot weld uh, splatter. Yeah, splatter. So the initial solution was take a file and by hand, knock the tops of the spot welds off. I wouldn't feel comfortable giving a Smith blade to a customer with scratches from a file like that on the inside, even if they're never gonna see them. Because when you do take apart your knife to service it, that just looks lazy. So we needed a better solution. So how do we do that? Well, the plan is we make a fixture table that you can install front scales into, hold in place somehow, and then have the CNC machine come in and just kiss the tops of the spot welds, removing that slag of titanium without making it look all gross and scratched up like that. Now, luckily, because this is not machining the whole knife, in fact, it's literally just touching where the spot welds are, the jig doesn't have to be that accurate, which means I could probably 3D print the jig and it would be fine to locate these Smith blades and hold them in place for the CNC machine to come and touch those spot welds. But I thought it would be kind of a cool race. Why don't I try 3D printing the jig and why don't I try making an aluminum jig at the same time using the Carvera? Which one do you think I'll finish first? The 3D printed one or the solid aluminum one? All right, so I've whipped together this design for a aluminum fixture plate to go in the Carvera and hold up to six Smith blades to have the spot welds machined off automatically by the CNC machine. I also made a 3D printed, which I'm gonna to send to the 3D printer right now, and we'll race. We'll see, will this print faster than the Carvera takes to machine the entire aluminum block? So now I'm gonna pop open my Caracam. So now I'm just gonna import the 3D model right here. So we're going to make sure it's at zero. It's going to do a 3D pocket. And we're going to start with this guy. And we're actually going to use the quarter inch tool. And we can we can really push this because it's actually a high feed, high feed tool. All right, so using three tools, I can machine this entire block. We've got op one, op two, op three, op four, and then the tapping. Re-enable all those. Hit export. Hey, that looks good. Load the G code. Just gonna hit run. I'm just gonna use the ETS to confirm the height of the probe. All right, so now we're touching off the surface. We get our Z zero. It's gonna move back there and ask me for my tool. So I'm using a high feed five flute pin mill. Now let's uh, see a hog some aluminum. 
We've received a couple of emails from people being like, I bought this a couple days ago, like, when is it coming? And we were like, turns out there's a bunch of scam websites trying to pretend to sell the Smith Blade. Just so you guys know, we are the only ones selling the Smith Blade. If it's not from us, it's not real. It's a scam. Was it you, Logan? Did you, did you get scammed? No. All right, I think the Carvera one, we got about, we got another 56 minutes on a 3D print. Um, let me clean this up, see if it's good. <laughs> Those threads worked. And they do indeed. All right. No play. We have a winner. Many, many minutes later. All right. We did for our kata. Question is, will it work as well? The answer is probably. Nice fit. Bolt goes through. So yeah, I could have 3D printed it, but I've got an aluminum fixture now, which is definitely gonna last longer, and. Will still be better than this, but that just goes to show you can use both technologies. It just depends what you're trying to achieve. All right, there we go. Two perfectly functional jigs that we can use in the Carvera to clean up these spot welds. Did you guys think the Carvera would win? The 3D printed one actually took about an hour and a half longer than doing the aluminum one, which included me doing the cam programming and setting up the part. Now. 3D printing gets all the love these days because it's, it's the new hotness and 3D printing is really fast. But the place that CNC machines still come out on top is their ability to make things A, out of metal, and B, when you're making a large part, it's way more effective to remove material than it is for a 3D printer to add all of the material. So that's why making an aluminum fixture was actually faster than 3D printing including the cam programming time, which is pretty darn cool. All right, so that was the easy part, making the fixtures. Now I need to write the program to actually machine the spot welds. That part took a bit of trial and error, but I ended up having an entire solution ready for implementation in less than 24 hours. And I'm happy to say we've been using it now for the past eight weeks. And technically every single Smith blade has been machined by a consumer CNC machine for a finishing touch. And in case you guys missed it in the last vlog, you can now check out Hacksmith.store and actually see our live production process. And I'm super excited to announce we have shipped 308 of our 1000 Founders Editions and production has been increasing fairly steadily. Don't mind the red lines, those are, you know, solving quality issues. Um, but things are heading in the right direction and we're just gonna get faster from here. So thanks again for watching and I hope you've been enjoying this sneak peek into the crazy world of manufacturing knives.